Chapter Twenty of *The Turn of the Screw* by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Just as in the churchyard with Miles, the whole thing was upon us. Much as I had made of the fact that this name had never once between us been sounded, the quick, smitten glare with which the child's face now received it fairly likened my breach of the silence to the smash of a pane of glass. It added to the interposing cry, as if to stay the blow, that Mrs. Groves, at the same instant, uttered over my violence the shriek of a creature scared, or rather wounded, which in turn within a few seconds was completed by a gasp of my own. I seized my colleague's arm. "'She's there! She's there!' Miss Jessel stood before us on the opposite bank, exactly as she had stood the other time and I remember strangely, as the first feeling now produced in me, my thrill of joy at having brought on a proof. She was there, and I was justified. She was there, and I was neither cruel nor mad. She was there for poor, scared Mrs. Groves, but she was there most for Flora, and no moment of my monstrous time was perhaps so extraordinary as that in which I consciously threw out to her with the sense that, pale and ravenous demon as she was, she would catch and understand it, an inarticulate message of gratitude. She stood erect on the spot my friend and I had lately quitted, and there was not, in all the long reach of her desire, an inch of her evil that fell short. This first vividness of vision and emotion were things of a few seconds during which Mrs. Groves's dazed blink across to where I pointed, struck me as a sovereign sign that she too at last saw, just as it carried my own eyes precipitately to the child. The revelation, then, of the manner in which Flora was affected startled me, in truth, far more than it would have done to find her also merely agitated, for direct dismay was of course not what I had expected. Prepared and on her guard as our pursuit had actually made her, she would repress every betrayal, and I was therefore shaken on the spot by my first glimpse of the particular one for which I had not allowed. To see her, without a convulsion of her small pink face, not even feign to glance in the direction of the prodigy I announced, but only, instead of that, turn at me an expression of hard, still gravity, an expression absolutely new and unprecedented, and that appeared to read and accuse and judge me, this was a stroke that somehow converted the little girl herself into the very presence that could make me quail. I quailed even though my certitude that she thoroughly saw was never greater than that that instant, and in the immediate need to defend myself I called it passionately to witness. "'She's there, you unhappy little thing! There! 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 And you see her as well as you see me!' I had said shortly before to Mrs. Groves that she was not at these times a child, but an old, old woman, and that description of her could not have been more strikingly confirmed than in the way in which, for all answer to this, she simply showed me, without a concession, an admission of her eyes, a countenance of deeper and deeper, of indeed suddenly quite fixed reprobation. I was, by this time, if I can put the whole thing at all together, more appalled at what I may properly call her manner than at anything else, though it was simultaneously with this that I became aware of having Mrs. Groves also, and very formidably to reckon with. My elder companion, the next moment, at any rate, blotted out everything but her own flushed face, and her loud, shocked protest, a burst of high disapproval. "'What a dreadful turn, to be sure, miss! Where on earth do you see anything?' I could only grasp her more quickly yet, for even while she spoke the hideous plain present stood undimmed and undaunted. It had already lasted a minute, and it lasted while I continued, seizing my colleague, quite thrusting her at it and presenting her to it, to insist with my pointing hand. "'You don't see her exactly as we see. You mean to say you don't now? Now? She's as big as a blazing fire. Only look, dearest woman, look!' She looked even as I did, and gave me, with her deep groan of negation, repulsion, compassion, the mixture with her pity of her relief at her exemption, a sense touching to me even then that she would have backed me up if she could. I might well have needed that, for with this hard blow of the proof that her eyes were hopelessly sealed, I felt my own situation horribly crumble. I felt, I saw, 
my livid predecessor press from her position on my defeat, and I was conscious, more than all, of what I should have from this instant to deal with in the astounding little attitude of Flora. Into this attitude Mrs. Groves immediately and violently entered, breaking, even while there pierced through my sense of ruin, a prodigious private triumph, and a breathless reassurance. "'She isn't there, little lady, and nobody's there, and you never see nothing, my sweet. How can poor Miss Jessel, when poor Miss Jessel's dead and buried? We know, don't we, love?' And she appealed, blundering in to the child. "'It's all a mere mistake, and a worry, and a joke, and we'll go home as fast as we can.' Our companion, on this, had responded with a strange, quick primness of propriety, and they were again, with Mrs. Groves on her feet, united, as it were, in pained opposition to me. Flora continued to fix me with her small mask of reprobation, and even at that minute I prayed God to forgive me for seeming to see that, as she stood there holding tight to our friend's dress, her incomparable childish beauty had suddenly failed, had quite vanished. I've said it already. She was literally, she was hideously hard. She had turned common, and almost ugly. "'I don't know what you mean. I see nobody. I see nothing. I never have. I think you're cruel. I don't like you.' Then, after this deliverance, which might have been that of a vulgarly pert little girl in the street, she hugged Mrs. Groves more closely, and buried in her skirt the dreadful little face. In this position she produced an almost furious wail. "'Take me away! Take me away! Oh, take me away from her!' "'From me!' I panted. "'From you! From you!' she cried. Even Mrs. Groves looked across at me dismayed, while I had nothing to do but communicate again with the figure that on the opposite bank, without a movement, as rigidly still as if catching beyond the interval our voices, was as vividly there for my disaster as it was not there for my service. The wretched child had spoken exactly as if she had got from some outside source each of her little stabbing words, and I could therefore in the full despair of all I had to accept but sadly shake my head at her. If I had ever doubted, all my doubt would at present have gone. I have been living with the miserable truth, and now it is only too much closed round me. Of course I've lost you. I've interfered. And you've seen, under her dictation, with which I faced over the pool again our infernal witness, the easy and perfect way to meet it. I've done my best, but I've lost you. Good-bye. For Mrs. Groves I had an imperative, an almost frantic, Go! Go! Before which, in infinite distress, but mutely possessed of the little girl, and clearly convinced, in spite of her blindness, that something awful had occurred and some collapse engulfed us, she retreated, by the way we had come, as fast as she could move. Of what first happened when I was left alone, I had no subsequent memory. I only knew that at the end of, I suppose, a quarter of an hour, an odorous dampness and roughness, chilling and piercing my trouble, had made me understand that I must have thrown myself on my face on the ground, and given way to a wildness of grief. I must have lain there long, and cried, and sobbed, for when I raised my head the day was almost done. I got up and looked a moment through the twilight at the grey pool, and its blank haunted edge, and then I took back to the house my dreary and difficult course. When I reached the gate in the fence, the boat, to my surprise, was gone so that I had a fresh reflection to make on Flora's extraordinary command of the situation. She passed that night, by the most tacit, and, I should add, were not the word so grotesque a false note, the happiest of arrangements with Mrs. Groves. I saw neither of them on my return, but, on the other hand, as by an ambiguous compensation, I saw a great deal of miles. I saw, I can use no other phrase, so much of him, that it was as if it were more than it had ever been. No evening I had passed at Bly had the portentous quality of this one, in spite of which, and in spite also of the deeper depths of consternation that had opened beneath my feet, there was literally, in the ebbing actual, an extraordinarily sweet sadness. 
On reaching the house I had never so much as looked for the boy. I had simply gone straight to my room to change what I was wearing, and to take in, at a glance, much material testimony to Flora's rupture. Her little belongings had all been removed. When later by the schoolroom fire I was served with tea by the usual maid, I indulged, on the article of my other pupil, in no inquiry whatever. He had his freedom now. He might have it to the end. Well, he did have it, and it consisted, in part at least, of his coming in at about eight o'clock and sitting down with me in silence. On the removal of the tea-things I had blown out the candles and drawn my chair closer. I was conscious of a mortal coldness, and felt as if I should never again be warm. So, when he appeared, I was sitting in the glow with my thoughts. He paused a moment by the door as if to look at me. Then, as if to share them, came to the other side of the hearth and sank into a chair. We sat there in absolute stillness. Yet he wanted, I felt, to be with me. End of chapter 20